In the complexity and the busyness of life, God has allowed us the opportunity to come together in simplicity and in purity to worship Him. And as we know, life can be very complex, can it? Situation and circumstances can be difficult to sort out. So where do we go to find the answers to these difficulties? Well, we know where we should go, but where do we go? For many of us, we've looked for answers in a variety of places until we could look nowhere else except the Bible, and then we didn't look anywhere else because we found the answer. It's the Word of God that gives us the answers to our lives, to life, the answers to our difficulties and to our problems. In the Word of God, we find wisdom. We find the wisdom of God. We find divine truth to help us through the difficulties of our lives. It's practical teaching. We're told in Proverbs chapter 3 that the one who looks to God, the one who leans on Him, the one who leans on His Word, will find wisdom. He says that he will be able to follow the path of life that God has laid out for him. The path that God has intended for him to follow. That sounds good. So where do we start on this path? How do we get on the road? We're told in Proverbs 9, 10 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That is our starting point. And so that is where we start today. That is where we stand. We come and we sit at the feet of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, but we come to Him in awe and in reverence. And yes, we come to Him in holy fear and we pray that our hearts would be right before Him. And if they are, He promises to speak to us. He promises to lead us. He promises to guide us. Lord God, we come before you. Search our hearts, Lord. Know our thoughts. Help us to come before you with an attitude that is worthy of the one before whom we stand this morning. You are the God of the universe. And Lord God, we bow down at your feet. We come before you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. By his blood, we are saved and you have told us to come before you boldly. So we do, Lord. But we come before you reverently, knowing that you are God and we are your people. I pray, Lord God, in our weakness, you will give us your strength. In our frailty, frailty, you would give us, give us power to live for you, power to stand. I pray, Lord God, that you would give us insight and understanding into your word, that we would see things from your perspective. And Lord God, then you would lead us on that path, on that path that leads home to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We are, it seems by nature, a stubborn and a self-centered people. At least that's the way we see other people. Sometimes we say that they're as stubborn as a mule. Well, we don't, we don't say that about ourselves. We don't think we're that stubborn. Individualistic, perhaps, but certainly not unreasonable. But our stubbornness is clearly seen in our understanding of God. At least that's how God sees it. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3, he says this. He says, the ox knows its owner. He says, the donkey knows its master's feeding trough. He said, but you don't know me. He said, you don't recognize me. He said, you don't know that I'm the one who has created you. I'm the one who has nourished you. He says, you don't understand that 
The blessings that you have are blessings that come from me. Many of us have lived our lives. We've raised our families. We've worked hard. We've given back to the community and and to our nation. But we haven't considered that the ability to do what we have done, the opportunities that we have been given, have all been a gift. They've been a gift from God. It all comes from his hand. What did Job say in Job 12? He says that our life, our very next breath, comes from him. It's in his hand. Aren't you aware of that, Paul said? Romans chapter 2, he said, Aren't you aware that the kindness that God has shown to you in allowing you to even have life, the forbearance that he's shown you, the anoche, he has restrained judgment on you. He said, don't you know that the patience that he has given you, even when you have ignored him all of these years, he says, don't you know that his kindness, his forbearance, his patience have all been designed for one purpose. And Paul said that purpose is that you might understand and you might be led to repentance. That you might know the value of who he is. And in knowing that, you might turn to him. That you might turn to Christ, change your heart, change your mind, and come to Christ. He says otherwise, your stubbornness, And your unrepentant heart will result in God's judgment on the day of judgment. Here is where we need wisdom. We need to understand this. We need to understand things from God's perspective. We need to know and understand that the end of time is coming. Eternity is about to begin. We need that wisdom to bring our lives in line. For many people, they don't think that way, do they? It's not a concern for for them. They're not even interested in what God has to say. They're not even interested in the God who has created them, who has given them life, even in the face of eternity, even in the face of judgment. They are more stubborn than a mule. And that is what we see as God's judgments fall on the people of the earth at the end of the tribulation. We see a people who are stubborn and who are unrepentant in their hearts. Last week as we looked at Revelation chapter 15, we saw seven angels with seven bowls, full, we are told, of the wrath, of the anger of God. Wrath against those who have refused God's offer of salvation, who have not listened to his warnings that judgment was about to fall, and it is about to fall. We've heard his warnings throughout the entire book of Revelation. Warnings from natural disasters. Warnings from political and economic difficulties. Warnings from angels. Warnings from from birds. Warnings from God's people. But the people then will be like the people today. They'll just refuse to listen to those warnings. They'll be too busy, too preoccupied. And so God's judgment will come. Revelation 15, 1, we are told that this set and series of final judgments are to be the last, the final, but the most devastating judgments that have ever been seen on the earth. Revelation chapter 16, the warnings are over. Revelation chapter 16, judgment has finally come. Verse 1, John said, I heard a loud voice. John has told us that he's heard a loud voice over 20 times so far in the book of Revelation. 
He's heard voices from heaven. He's heard voices of angels. He's heard voices of those who belong to Christ who have gone to heaven. But this time, he says in verse 1, he hears a voice from the temple, from the naos, from the inner sanctuary, from the place where God dwells. He hears the voice of God. Revelation 15, 8, we're told as God was about to pour out his judgment on the earth. We are told that his glory and his power filled the temple like smoke. And it was so overwhelming, so overpowering, we're told that no one could stand in his presence. And so, God stood alone. And now he speaks. Isaiah 66, 6 says that the Lord speaks from his temple to render unto the people what they deserve. And that's about to happen. He tells these angels, verse 1, these seven angels to go. Hapago, leave. And pour out and empty these seven bowls of wrath. The wrath of God poured out on the people of earth. God's fierce anger, his wrath is about to be poured out in these plagues, plague, in these wounds. And they're about to fall like a storm. And so, verse 2, it says the first angel went out and he poured out his bowl on the earth, the first wound. And it said it became a loathsome, a kakos, a foul smelling and a malignant paneros, a, a diseased sore. A helicos, an ulcer, from out of nowhere. People have sores. Perhaps they'll be like the sores of Lazarus. Remember that? Luke chapter 16, it said, he was a beggar, he sat by the gate, and, and he begged as the dogs licked his sores. But they, perhaps they'll be a little closer to what we find in Zechariah chapter 14. It says there that their flesh will rot as they stand on their feet. And their eyes will rot in their sockets. And their tongues will rot in their mouth. This is horrible. This is judgment. God's judgment being poured out upon, verse 2 says, upon the men who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Behold, Numbers says, Numbers 32, 23. It says, you have sinned against the Lord and behold... Your sin will find you out. Like the people today. The people in the tribulation will be enjoying what Hebrews says, the pleasures, the passing pleasures of sin. They'll have no thought. They'll have no regard for God. They will appear to be getting away with sin. Maybe they'll be rich. Maybe they'll be famous. Maybe they'll be healthy and wealthy. Maybe they'll just be enjoying themselves. But Job reminds us that the triumph of the wicked is short. And the joy of the godless is momentary. James 5 says, you have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. The Antichrist promised these people peace. He promised them prosperity. He promised them security if they would worship him and not worship Christ. He said he was more powerful than God. But now the truth is seen. The truth is seen as they see their flesh fall off their bones and there's nothing that anyone can do about it. Not even him. And right on top of that, before they even have a chance to recover, it says in verse 3, this second angel poured out his bowl into the sea. Second wound. First angel poured out his bowl on the people on the earth. This angel pours out his bowl into the oceans. The oceans cover over 70% of the world, don't they? They are a source of food for us. Source... Uh, Source of oxygen. Third to half of the oxygen that we breathe comes from the ocean. They affect our climate, affect the weather. We get medicine 
vitamins from the plants and the animals in the sea. And then in an instant, we're told, verse 3, it's gone. It says, it became blood, like, like the blood of a dead man, like a necros, like a corpse. All of a sudden, it becomes thick and dark and coagulated like a pool of blood. And in an instant, verse 3 says, every living thing in the sea died. The plant life, the animal life, all the sea creatures are dead. And they begin to wash up on the shore with a stench of contaminated flesh. Genesis chapter 1. We read that God created the sea, didn't he? Genesis 1.21, it says that he then created life in the sea. What he created to be a blessing for us, a blessing of health and life, has now become a curse. It's become a sea of death. Why? Because of our sin. Because of the sins of the people. Look at what sin does. Look at what it does to us. Look at how it affects everything in our lives. Look at how it affects everything good that God has given to us. That is the horror of sin. And then a third angel, verse 4. This third angel pours out his bowl, the third wound. He pours out his bowl, it says, on the rivers, on the springs, on the fresh water supply of the earth. And it says, verse 4, they became blood. No more water for drinking. No more water for bathing. No more water for cooking. No more water for anything. We're told that our bodies are made up of how much? 70% water. Some say 45%. Some say 65%. Whatever the percentage is, there's one thing that's certain. We can't survive very long without water. Jeremiah chapter 2, it says, they have forsaken me. That's what God says. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that have no water. What is God saying there? He's saying, they have abandoned me. He said, I am the source of life, the living water. And so now, Fresh water is taken away. The physical source of life is taken away from the people. I said, wow, this is horrible. We haven't even gotten through all of these judgments yet. Already we're blown away. And some people say these judgments are too harsh. They're too strong. Well, in response to that, an angel speaks. Verse 5 if he read our minds. This angel speaks, John says, and I heard the angel of the water saying, righteous art thou. He speaks to God. He doesn't speak to us. He says, you alone are perfect. Do you believe that? He said, yes, you alone are righteous. You alone are above reproach. You are the eternal God. He says in verse 5, who art and who wast you forever exist. You are the Holy One. There's no one like you. He said, you alone are pure. That's your character, the angel says. That's who you are. And so, what you do, you do according to your character. He says in verse 5, because thou, because thou hast done these things and judged these things, your judgment is according to your character. If we believe that God is good and right and just, then we have to believe that everything that he does is good and right and just. And that's what this angel says. He says, when you evaluate sin and you render a decision and you pronounce judgment, it is a righteous judgment. It is the right decision. Verse 6, he says, because they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, they have, they have tormented 
and tortured and killed your people. They've killed your messengers, your servants, those who have taken a stand for you and have been faithful to you even unto death. And so he says in verse 6, Now thou hast given them blood to drink. And he says in verse 6, They deserve it. He says they're guilty of shedding innocent blood. They've, re they've rejected the truth of your word. They've rejected your son. And he said you have evaluated them and you have found them guilty and worthy. Axios. Weighed in the balance. And he said, you have judged them. Nothing remains for them except terrifying judgment. These are some pretty strong words, aren't they? Some pretty strong words from this angel. But they're not the only words that, God, that uh, John hears. He says in verse 7, he says, I heard from the altar, the place where the prayers, our prayers, the prayers of believers have been waiting to be answered. The place where those who have been killed during the tribulation have been waiting for justice. And a voice comes from there. And this voice says in verse 7, O Lord, God Almighty, you are righteous. You are true. And righteous and true are your judgments. The judge of the earth will do what is right. Our blood will be avenged. Your justice will prevail. Your kingdom will be established. And no one and nothing will stop it. Verse 8, the fourth angel. A fourth angel pours out his bowl. The fourth wound. And it pour, he pours it out, it says, on the sun. First the earth, the people of the earth. The water, now the sun. Genesis chapter 1, we're told that the sun was created on the fourth day. And ever since that day, the sun has been our source of light and heat and health and energy. But again, what God created for our blessing, he has turned into a curse. Why? Because of the wickedness and the rebellion of those whom he created. How all of this must grieve the heart of God. That those he created to love him and to worship him have instead chosen to curse their creator, to curse him not only with their mouths, but by their lives. How it must grieve him to see those that he loves suffering. And so, we are told the son will become a curse. Verse 8, it says, And it was given to it to scorch Men with fire, kautosasai and purai in Greek. It means to burn them up. Burn them with extreme heat, radiation. They'll be scorched, it says in verse 9, with fierce heat. Like third degree burns. But instead of crying out to God, instead of coming to Him and seeking mercy and help, what does it say the people do in verse 9? It says they blasphemed the name of God who had the power over these plagues and they did not repent to give him glory. How can their hearts be so hardened? Did you ever ask that question? When you see people who don't know Christ? Even in the middle of their problems and their difficulties? even as they are on the edge of death? Say, so how can their hearts be so hardened? Do they love their sin that much that they won't come to Christ? These people know where these judgments are coming from. But still, we're told that they curse God. Still, they refuse to turn to Christ, 
even in this extreme situation, the voice of sin speaks louder to them than the voice of God. They are more stubborn than mules. Then a fifth angel pours out his bowl, a fifth wound, it says in verse 10, is poured out on the throne of the beast and on his kingdom. This kingdom of the beast, of the Antichrist, will cover the entire earth. It'll dominate. It'll dominate everything. But now, he will be known for who he is. He's just a man. And he's helpless. Just like every other man is helpless under the hand of God's judgment. As the earth, it says, is darkened. And as they gnaw and chew on their tongues, it says, because of the pain. But still, even in their pain, they use those same tongues, verse 11 says, to blaspheme the God of heaven because of the pains and the sores. And still it says, still, I can't believe it says that in verse 11, still they will not repent of their deeds. This is the last time in the Bible that the word repent, repentance, is used. The last time. Time has run out. And the sixth angel, verse 12, poured out his bowl. The sixth wound is poured out. This wound doesn't bring any more pain. Doesn't bring any more suffering to the people on the earth. It says there in verse 12, it's poured out on the great river Euphrates. And it says the water was dried up. Like all the rivers of the world, this river will become a river of blood. But it says God will dry up that river. Why? Why does he do that? Verse 12 tells us. It says that the way might be prepared for the kings of the east. Now it's ready. Now it's ready for the armies of the east to come and to march over this dried up riverbed. Ready, prepared for a final battle. The final judgment and the hill country called Har Megiddo on the plain of Megiddo. What we would call the slaughter at Armageddon. And I saw, verse 13, John says, I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Who is that? The serpent, Satan. He said, and coming out of the mouth of the beast, the wild beast, the Antichrist, and coming out of the mouth of the false prophet, the pretender. He says, I saw this. He says, I saw three unclean spirits like, like frogs. Leviticus 11, we are told that frogs were considered detestable and unclean, but these are not literal frogs. They're demons. Akathertos in Greek, foul spirits, the breath of wickedness. It says, verse 14, for they are the spirits of demons. They're demons, demonion, they're supernatural. And it says they are sent out to influence people. To influence the people of the world. And how do they do that? Verse 14, it says by performing, performing semion, miracles, signs, wonders, false miracles to counterfeit the miracles of God. Why? It says, verse 14, so that they might influence the king's of the world. That's the target. They're to influence the rulers, those in power, those with authority. And they are to influence them, verse 14 says, so they might gather together to make war on the great day of God the Almighty. The stage has been set. It's been ready. It's ready for the final battle. The armies of the earth will be marching to their death. Everything's about to come to a conclusion. It's all about to come to an end as Christ comes 
to lead his army against these armies of the earth. And so Christ speaks here in this chapter. Verse 15, he speaks to his people who will be on the earth during this time as judgment is about to fall, as the end is coming. And he says in verse 15, behold, he says, listen to me. He says, I am coming like a thief. Like a thief who comes unexpectedly, without warning. He said, I am coming in an hour that you will not know. He said, don't expect any further announcements. He said, don't expect any additional warnings. He said, I'm telling you now to be ready, to be on guard, to be living in such a way that you bring honor to Christ. Those are words he could speak to us as well, aren't they? Those are words that we need to hear. We need to be living in a way that brings honor to him when he comes to take us home. But he speaks these words to these believers. Whatever believers happen to be left at this time. And he says in verse 15, Blessed is the one who stays awake. Blessed is the one who is ready, who is living with the expectation of his coming. Who's not preoccupied with other things. Who hasn't been diverted into things that really don't matter. These people will be living in a difficult time. More difficult than anything we have ever known. And Christ says, you need to be ready. He says, it's about to happen. Blessed is he, he says in verse 15, who keeps his garments lest he walk about naked and men see his shame. What's he talking about? It's a picture of a soldier. It's a picture of a soldier who is dressed in his uniform, in his armor. He is dressed and he is ready. He is equipped for battle. Not only the physical battle, but the spiritual battle that will take place. Remember, the world leaders will be deceived by demons into thinking that they must fight against Christ. After all of this, they will be deceived and think they can win against the God of heaven. So Christ says, you need to be like a soldier. You need to be dressed in readiness, ready for that battle. Have confidence in Christ, John said in 1 John 2.28, so that when he comes, you will not shrink back in shame at his coming. That's how we need to live, so that we won't shrink back in shame when he comes for us. Verse 16, and so they gathered together in a place in Hebrew, which is called Har Megiddon. Gathered for this final battle, a battle which will take place after this last bowl is poured out. Verse 17, it is the final bowl the final judgment, the seventh and the final wound. This angel pours it out, we are told, upon the air, epe, tonaira, in the sky. And he said there, there was a loud voice that came out of the temple from the throne. Who's that? That's God speaking again. And he says, it is done. Gigonen, it has come to pass. It's completed. And all of a sudden, John says, he saw, verse 18, lightning, flashes, bright, blinding flashes. And he said he heard sounds, voices. And he heard peals of thunder, like explosions. And he said there was a great earthquake. An earthquake as such there had not been on the earth since man had come on the earth. So great an earthquake it was, he says. So violent a shaking. So mighty and intense. It says in verse 19 that the great city of Jerusalem was split 
into three parts. Split. Why? In preparation for the king. In preparation for Christ, who is coming to rule in Jerusalem. But everywhere else, verse 19, it says, the cities of the nations fell. There'll be a massive destruction. The cities will be leveled, flattened. In verse 19, it says, Babylon the Great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. Who is this? What is this? This is the kingdom of the Antichrist. The kingdom of the Antichrist will be destroyed to prepare for the kingdom of Christ on earth. Verse 20, in every island, it says, fled away and the mountains were not found. The geography, the topography, the land is changed. Everything becomes flat, like a plain, like open country. It's all different. Preparing for the king, preparing for Christ. And then finally, verse 21, the end has come. It says, huge hailstones, about a hundred pounds each, came down from heaven upon men. Do you know the largest hailstone on record? Two pounds. Two pound hailstone could do a lot of damage. But nothing like 100 pounds of ice falling on you. People be crushed. But read that last verse. Right up until the end. Right up till the very end, it says in verse 21, they will blaspheme God because of the plague of hell, because the plague was extremely severe. Oh yeah, it's the end. But still, they refuse to come to Christ. What did we read in Proverbs this morning? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Without reverence for God, there is no wisdom. There are no answers to our problems. There are no answers for our difficulty. There is no answer. There is no escape from the wrath of God. You know what the Proverbs says? Those who... who who don't come to Christ, it says they hate him. It says not only do they not fear him, but they hate him. Proverbs 8.36 says they love death. Those who don't come to Christ, those who don't know him, we are told love death. God offers life. Christ offers eternal life. It's the same warning that he brings today. He uses events around us to draw us to himself. He uses people to speak to us. He uses the word of God to give us God's perspective. And as these people look at themselves in the mirror and they see those those sores and they see those burns and as they gasp for their next breath, they won't listen to the voice of God. They don't want his wisdom. They don't want him. It'll be too late for them. But it's not too late for us. It's not too late for you. It's not too late if you are not as stubborn as a mule. If you choose to come to Christ that you might have life and you will have life eternal with him. Lord God, your word is powerful and it is, it is overwhelming. What is about to happen on this earth, Lord God, we know is the result of, of our sin. It is the result of our rejection of you and your plan. It is the result of our rejection of your son. 
Thank you, Lord, for giving us eyes. Thank you for giving us eyes to see your, the truth. Thank you for giving us a heart that, that has understood. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for saving us from the wrath to come and giving us the promise of an eternity with you. I pray, Lord, for those who might hear these words, that they don't have to travel this path. They don't have to be a part of this tribulation and suffering. They don't have to be separated from you forever. I pray, Lord God, that you might be pleased to use your word to reach those who need to know. I pray that the Holy Spirit would open their eyes, that they would fall at your feet and trust Christ as their Savior. Thank you, Lord, for his blood that has been poured out for us. We are yours, Lord, and we are in awe of who you are, and we are in awe that you would reach out to us, sinners like us, and save us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your great love for us, even when we were your enemies. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.